morning scripture reading will be coming from Colossians 3, 5 through 7. <clears throat> Colossians 3, 5 through 7. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, unclean, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concup, concups, concupiscence, and covetous, which is adultery. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of the disobedience, in which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. I'm well, glad to see everybody here today. Hope that you are all doing well and have had a good week and are ready to start this new week together. And thankfully, we'll be here again tonight. And so let me go ahead and say something about that. It is going to be a, uh, a Bible class. So here are two things we're going to do. Number one, if you have any questions about anything I said, I can't tell you over the years how many times after a Sunday morning sermon, somebody will come up to me and say, what did you say about this? Or what verse did you? So if you have any questions about something that's studied this morning, bring those with you tonight. And I'll address those. You can ask those questions. And if there are no questions, that's how we'll start. I've got a second topic that I want to address that actually one of the members here sent me a question about. So that's how we'll handle tonight, 6 o'clock. Look forward to seeing you here again this evening. Our invitation song will be, Is Thy Heart Right With God, in just a few moments. Let's talk for a few minutes about Christian modesty. Interesting topic. I never, I'll start out here. I never went into youth ministry. I started preaching full time when I was 18 after I graduated school at Memphis. And a lot of people over the years asked me, why didn't you start off in youth ministry? A lot of people think that there's some kind of stepping stone system for, for preaching the gospel, that you've got to start out as a youth minister and then you become a, a real preacher. Uh, well, that's not how it works. I'll tell you the main reason I've told Gail this. I've told a lot of people this over the years. One of the main reasons I did not get into youth ministry, parents. Because parents can be worse than the kids sometimes because that's their baby. Anyway, that's just me. This is one of those topics, though, that can stir up some interesting discussions and disagreements. But I want us to study it from a biblical perspective. The fact of the matter is the word modesty is used only twice in Scripture and one time specifically in reference to one's clothing. So let's define some terms. You know I like to do that when I start typically any lesson. Modesty, what does that word mean? Well, in the English, Standard English Dictionary, I think this came from Merriam-Webster, Dressing or behaving so as to avoid impropriety or indecency. And let me, I'll just stop right there at the comma. That's, I, I guess that's always missed from, been missing from society in general. Propriety and decency in, at large. But I think the advent of, in my opinion, the advent of social media has really sped up indecency and impropriety. Just my opinion. Comma, especially to avoid attracting sexual attention. The Greek word comes from 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9. So go ahead and take your Bibles there. I meant to tell you to turn there in the first place. Go ahead and turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 2, and we'll look at this word in that context. This particular context here begins in verse 8, and Paul discusses the role of the male and the female. In the first seven verses of 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul talks about mankind in general. He uses the Greek term anthropos, okay, anthropology, the study of humankind, the study of mankind. It's interesting because when you start reading in verse 8, he uses the gender-specific terms for the man and the woman. And he starts talking about when Christian men and women are together. We're talking about the assembly here. So that's the context of 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through the end of the chapter, verse 15. The word there, so I'll just read the verse, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. So the Greek word there for modest means orderly, virtuous, decent, and then our word that it's translated here as modest 
or well-ordered. So different ideas behind that word or different terms that are used to define this term. But another word that pops up here in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 9 is this word shamefacedness. Shamefacedness. And this word means in the original, the New King James uses the word propriety. So look back up at that first definition. Dressing or behaving so as, uh, so as to avoid impropriety. The word shamefacedness here in 1 Timothy 2.9 means a sense of shame or modesty. And the New King James renders it as propriety. There is a way for Christians to dress properly in propriety. Or modestly. Then we have this word, sobriety, in the King James. The New King James uses the word moderation, and it means soundness of mind or self control. So we have these terms used in this context to, uh, to discuss this particular topic uh, about modest apparel. So here's the question why? What does it matter? Look at verse 10 here in our context. So here's what you don't do, verse 9, but. Uh, uh, parenthetical statement, which becometh women professing godliness. And that word becometh means is uh, appropriate for or is becoming for women who profess godliness with good works. All right, so turn over to 1 Peter chapter 3 now. This is the second passage that I have up here that addresses this particular subject. This is talking about the behavior of both wives, 1 Peter 3, 1 through 6, and husbands, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. And in that discussion, much in the same way that Paul uses language in talking about the males and the females, Paul, uh, Peter here is discussing how a believing woman, okay, a Christian female who has married a non-believing male, they need to be able to see your chaste conduct, verse 2, your pure behavior with fear, with reverence. Why? Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating of hair, of the wearing of gold, or of putting on of apparel. So let me say something here real quick. Because Paul addresses this back in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. L listen again to verse 9. Um, Adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. So I've, I actually knew a fellow several years ago that believed it was a sin for females to wear earrings or for females to put on makeup, anything like that. That is not what is being condemned here. What's being condemned is immodesty. He's saying you need to dress as that which becomes a godly woman. And you don't put the focus on the outward man. There's nothing wrong with being attractive. There's nothing wrong with wearing jewelry. That's not the point. He's contrasting where your uh, emphasis should be. It shouldn't be merely the outward appearance. But, verse 4, back to 1 Peter chapter 3. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible. See, the outer man, think about this. Remember what Paul said in 2 Timothy 4? The outward man perishes day by day. This, you know, this is fading. Our outward appearance is fading away, isn't it? Your inward man, though, is not corruptible. Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. And see, that's where our concern needs to lie. Are we more concerned with impressing God or man? That's the question. So there are extremes to this. And again, I've already shared one with you that, um, you know, it's a sin for women to wear makeup. And this same fellow that believed that believed it was also a sin for a woman to have I forget the exact length, but he had a length of how long her hair had to be. And if it was any shorter than that, it was a sin. Uh, I've yet to find that biblical verse. But if anybody knows where that is, you know, how long is too long or how short is too short? I don't know. Propriety. That's the biblical concept here. Do what's proper. Do what's decent uh, in regard to one who professes godliness. And let me say this, by the way, too. This goes for men and women. Propriety. Decency. Modesty. So you remember last week, one of the things I talked about in terms of tradition was what we wear to worship. And there is a societal, societal norm. The fact of the matter is that societal norm has changed over the years. When we're looking here, so going back to 1 Timothy chapter 2, again, we're looking at a time when Christian males and Christian females are together. What's the dress code? Modesty. 
And you look at that term again. Dressing or behaving so as to avoid impropriety or indecency. And one of the things that both Paul and Peter point out is that you can overdo it and be immodest. You can have too much stuff on and draw attention to yourself, and that would be immodest. I think a lot of times we, we define immodesty as not having enough clothing on. And certainly we can talk about that, and we will. But you can also be immodest by having too much stuff on and drawing attention to oneself. We have to understand that as well. So here's the question then. When it comes to the term modest or modest apparel, again, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9, is there a biblical standard? Because you can guarantee you go around and survey a lot of people and you're going to get different standards of, yeah, that's appropriate, that's not appropriate. And I'm going to actually draw this out a little bit later on in the lesson. So here's what I want us to do. Let's, go to, let's start in Genesis chapter 3 together. And let's look at just a couple things in the biblical text here that might set out for us a standard of decency. I've been thinking about doing this lesson for some time. And so when I got here this morning, Tim and I were talking about this and something I saw the other day that just, you know what, I'm going ahead and preaching on this. <laughs> so that's why we're talking about this subject today. I know a lot of preachers, they plan their sermons out a year ahead of time. I've seen the calendars. I don't care to do that. You know, things come up, you need to change, you might be sick, it's, and that'll throw, that'll throw your whole schedule off. Uh, I think it was Monday or Tuesday I saw something and I thought, I need to talk about this. Genesis 3, 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree, to desired, to, a tree desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of both of them were opened and they, were, uh, and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So looking at this term here, aprons, the New King James uses the term the, the English term coverings. Basically, what you're talking about here, if you were to look this up, you're talking about a pair of underwear. A loincloth is what you're talking about. A belt or a girdle. This is what Adam and Eve made for themselves because as the biblical text says, they, they, they now, it's not that they physically see something. They could see it before. It's the mental aspect of what's going on here. Hey, we need to cover up. And so they made for themselves aprons. Now, skip down to verse 21. The curses have been announced. And it says, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothed them. Look at that last phrase there in verse 21. And clothed them. What does that imply? Before they were not clothed. Now they had made something to put on. But they weren't clothed in God's eyes. So we're asking the question then, is there a standard? This word for coats, the New King James uses the word tunics, means a coat, a garment, or a robe. Basically what you're looking at here is a long shirt to cover stuff up. Okay? Why? You look at the end of verse 21, for that very reason. They had already made something for themselves when, their, when they came to this realization that, hey, we're naked. <laughs> we need to put something on. God made these coats of animal skins to cover them because from God's perspective, they were not covered. And see, so let's, talk, let's think about that for just a minute. I said before we got into the Genesis 3 text, I said you could go around and you could take a survey and it would be very subjective, wouldn't it? Everybody would have a different concept, a, a concept, a different standard of modesty. Too long, too short, too tight, too loose. I mean, that's, and it's that way with a lot of different biblical subjects. But the question then being, is there a biblical standard? God looked at them and said, you need some clothes on and gave them a long shirt or a robe to cover. Let's take our Bibles next and look at another passage that might indicate a standard for us. Exodus chapter 28. Here's the thing. There are some biblical topics that there's no question. Uh, it's, so one passage that I like to use in, in, in these types of discussions is Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. 
the secret things belong to God. That verse starts out by saying, the secret things belong to God. But those things which have been revealed to us have been revealed to us and to our children that we may keep all the words of this law. I also think of passages in this particular discussion, this specific discussion, of Romans 15.4. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. That we through patience and comforts of the comfort of the scriptures might have hope. We can learn some things, a lot of things, in fact, from the Old Testament. So what we have here, uh, beginning uh, after the deliverance of the law, as we have recorded for us in Exodus chapter 20, you get down to about Exodus 25. Moses goes up into the mountain. He receives, one of the things he receives while he's in the mountain is the pattern for the tabernacle, all of the instruments for the tabernacle, the services for the tabernacle, everything. And he's commanded to make everything according to the pattern that was shown to him in the mount. One of the things that was shown to him was the garments that were to be worn by the priesthood. So just for instance, beginning in verse 40, uh, Exodus 28. And for Aaron's sons, thou shalt make coats. That's the same word that God made for Adam and Eve in the garden. And thou shalt make for them girdles. That's what Adam and Eve had made for themselves once their eyes were opened. And thou shalt make for them, uh, uh, and bonnets, hats. I think the New King James says hats. Thou shalt make for them for glory and for beauty, and thou shalt put them upon Aaron thy brother and his sons with him, and thou shalt anoint them and consecrate them and sanctify them that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. Uh, and again, so you look here in the text at verse 42. And thou shalt make for them linen breeches. So I'm going to throw this up here on the screen. Breeches. The New King James says trousers. Basically what you're talking about here. What we would call them today is uh, like an undergarment. Why did he make those? Uh, again, it's important to ask these questions. Why did he make those linen breeches or those trousers? To cover their nakedness. Question. So you look back up at verse 40. He had already made them girdles. What Adam and Eve made for themselves in the garden. So why would, if, if they had that, why would they then need basically, what I would compare them, to do, compare them to today would be like athletic shorts. And I don't mean female athletic shorts, and I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. What does this cover? For the, from the loins, the waist, even unto the thighs shall they reach. And I'm going to bring something else out. I think maybe you haven't thought about this before, but I'm going to bring it up. There is, my point being, there is a biblical standard set of covered versus naked. Absolutely, there is a standard set. Why does this matter? Why are you talking about this? Because if you're going to profess godliness, you need to be proper. You need to be decent. And this is one of those subjects that we need to address. There is a biblical standard set from Genesis 3, from the garden, to uh, the building of the tabernacle, the construction of the instruments, and even down to what they wear. The New King James says here in verse 42, from the waist even down to the thighs. Cover your thighs up. How many of you in here over the years have gone to, and show me your hands, whether you're a kid or an adult or whatever, how many of you have ever gone to Green Valley Bible Camp? Okay, quite a few of you, counselors, I'm assuming, and campers. Well, Green Valley, I've never been there. I think Sarah went. Um, Real Foot Youth Camp, that's the second one up there. I used to help direct Real Foot Youth Camp when I preached in West Tennessee. BCC, that's Backwoods Christian Camp. I was heavily involved with that, and in fact, Gail was too. Garrett started going to Backwoods when he was, I don't know, a year and a half old maybe. So, and, and I grew up going to a... a Bible camp in Ohio. I forget. I can't remember the name of it. I tried to find it on the internet the other day and couldn't remember what it was called. Anyway, all of them, every one of them, have the same dress code. Have you ever wondered why? And parents, when you were sending your kids off to camp, did you have this discussion with them? So down there in Pensacola, when we when we would be getting ready for Backwoods Christian Camp, we had these stores and several stores in Pensacola called uh, Waterfront Ministries. And basically, this is where you could take your used clothing that was still in good shape, and they would sell it at a, 
an extremely discounted rate to help the poor. That's where we would go shop for church camp. In fact, that's where I'd go shop for mission trips overseas. It's hard to find decent clothing that, that matches the standard set by our Christian camp. So I'm going to put a couple screenshots up here. So this is the camp dress code for uh, Green Valley Bible Camp. The board of directors of Green Valley Bible Camp has passed the following rules and believes they are necessary to the running of an effective camp and effective camp that will contribute, listen, that will contribute to the spiritual welfare of the campers. And I know a lot of you guys know personally those who are, I guess you'd say, over Green Valley Bible Camp. Clothing, number one, all clothing must be modest. Now, again, that's a generic concept, isn't it? What does that mean? Again, you take a survey of a lot of people, you come up with different answers. So how do they define it? Well, no tank tops, low-cut garments, see-through tops, or bare midriffs. All shorts. And you notice all is in all caps. That means they're screaming at you. All shorts must be to the top of the knee. Suggest suggestive, inappropriate logos or advertisements on clothing will not be tolerated. You know, schools even have that system, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and then it goes on to various other types of dress. This is a screenshot from the uh, Backwoods Christian Camp um, dress code. Kindness, number one. That's a good one to start with. Uh, Boy-girl relationships are restricted to the holding of hands only. No PDA. Be careful about that. Dress code. Dresses, skirts, and shorts may be worn to the knee. Long jeans and pants may be worn if they are loose-fitting. Why would you emphasize that? Loose fitting. You know why, don't you? I know why. You're dealing with a bunch of kids. You're dealing with a bunch of teenagers, boys and girls. And they need to be proper. They need to be decent. Leggings may be worn if they are covered with a shirt. Why do they need to be covered? Because if you don't cover them, they leave very little to the imagination. Let's just be honest. Let's just call it what it is. It's immodest. Straps on blouses, shirts, and tops must be a minimum of three inches wide. And let me tell you, they'd measure. <laughs> I don't know about Green Valley, but backwoods, they'd measure. I talked to the director at Real Foot Youth Camp. He's a good friend of mine, preaches in Dyersburg, Tennessee. And so I read him some of these rules. He said, yep, that's ours. So you have this set standard that runs across the board at these Christian church camps. Why? Because there is this concept in Scripture of decency, propriety, modesty. So I want to share with you four things that are often presented, that have been presented to me personally, against what we've just been talking about. And I'll just say it like this. Arguments for why I can be immodest. That's, I'm just, <laughs> I think we should just call things for what they are. Because that's what happens. I want to give you four reasons why I can be immodest. And I want you to see if they fall within the parameters of scriptural propriety. Of scriptural modesty. Why are we talking about this? Because if we're going to claim to be people of God, you go back to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9. And again, in that context, he's talking about the males versus the females and their conduct in the public assembly. These are people professing godliness. My life needs to match that. You don't just profess godliness when you're inside a church building, folks. You know that just as well as I do. Here's arguments against modesty. Number one, I can't find modest clothing. You know what? It is hard, isn't it? There is no question about that. I've got two kids. I've got a 16-year-old girl. You know how many times we've had this discussion? You know, parenting is not a sprint. <laughs> it's a marathon, isn't it? You, it? And it doesn't end once they leave home. You, you realize how many times that we have had this discussion in our house, and I guarantee you, well, I hope, I guarantee you in connection with church camp you've had this discussion with your kids. Hopefully it doesn't go away after six or seven days out of town. But it's, the fact of the matter is it, it is hard particularly for our girls. And I talked about this a couple years ago in a sermon. Um, I've never preached a full lesson on this particular topic. But I think it's good to discuss these things. So here's just by way of example. 
I mean, everyday, real-life example, when you're talking about buying clothes for kids to get ready for school or athletic, you know, playing basketball, playing softball, whatever the case may be, okay? Just something that parents have to deal with, Christian parents have to deal with. We like to shop for those athletic clothes at places like Academy Sports or Hibbit or things like that. Have you ever noticed the difference between boys' shorts and girls' shorts? Now, back in the, what, 70s and 80s, for instance, you watch the NBA. <laughs> Larry Bird's the guy that stands out in my mind. Guy thighs, okay? Real short, tight shorts. <laughs> I've got a problem with that, okay? Nobody wants to see that. Why is it okay for a female to show that? Anybody got an answer for that? And like I'm, tell, like I'm talking to you, I'm, I deal with both sides of the coin. I've got one of each. And I've got to buy clothes for these kids. Okay, they grow. They're still growing. Why is, the, why is there a difference? Why is it okay for one to wear shorts that if, if their t-shirt was any longer, you wouldn't even know they had a pair of shorts on? Why is that okay for one gender, but then we look at the other gender and say, man, he needs to cover that up. What's the difference? And why do our clothing lines, you know, and this is kind of above our head here, why, does, why do people who produce clothing make them that way? Why are we okay with sexualizing our girls and shaming our boys? Something to think about, isn't it? I can't find modest clothing. Listen, I'll agree with that's hard. There's no question about that. I'm not going to argue with that one at all. Number two, they're so cute. I've heard this one. Define cute. I mean, again, whose definition are we dealing with here? Are you defining that in terms of modest or how much it shows? Something to think about. I don't want to stand out. I've actually had a Christian tell me this. If I get that, I'm going to look different from the other girls. Two thoughts. Number one, is that a problem? Number two, good. <laughs> End of discussion. And here's the th so here's the thing. Again, I'm, I'm coming to you as a parent. I'm not up here as a preacher preaching at you, okay? I'm with you. Who's the one buying the clothes? Who's the one earning the money to spend the money to pay for the stuff? Then act like a parent. Like a godly parent. You know, kids are good at playing, placing guilt trips. And I'm not, this hasn't happened with us. I'm, I'm not going off on my kids here because something they did this past week. So don't get me wrong here. But this, this is just real life. And this is the way we ought to talk about things. Um, I don't want to stand out. What does that mean? I'm going to look at, we're going to look at a passage of scripture here in just a minute. Here's number four. You shouldn't be looking. I've had girls tell me that. Well, Church camp girls. Well, the boys shouldn't be looking. You know how selfish and self-centered that attitude is? You remember what Paul said about eating meat if it would cause his brother to stumble? Well, they shouldn't eat it. Isn't that what he said? He said, I'll never eat it again if it causes my brother to offend. Some of these young people, along with their parents, need to read 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And again, the word offend biblically is not what it means in 21st century America. 21st century America means, well, you hurt my feelings. Biblically, the word offend is scandal. I will not do anything that is scandalous toward my brother or sisters. I won't have the attitude of, well, they shouldn't be looking at me. Why would you dress that way in the first place? You're trying to get people to not look at you? And again, this goes both ways. This is not just about girls. This is about boys can be just as immodest as girls. I think sometimes we, we take the wrong approach and just look at one, but the fact of the matter is, look at the clothing lines. That's the way clothing is made, and it's, it's a challenge. No question about it. But to take the attitude of you shouldn't be looking is an unbiblical, ungodly, selfish attitude, period. But what's society tell us? It, I need to, you know, this is about me. It's not about you. Christianity is the exact opposite of that. So, I want to show you two passages of Scripture that will destroy all of these arguments. 
Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And this one is in particular connection with the I don't want to stand out. Because again, that's one I've been handed personally over the years dealing with kids at church camp, dealing with kids at school and things of this nature. I've always tried to, <clears throat> in my preaching, wherever I've been, I've always tried to involve, be involved with the young people and encourage them in any way that I can. So I've heard this over the years. I don't want to stand out. Come out from among them and be ye separate. Then underline these three words. Saith the Lord. This isn't some church policy. This isn't some church camp policy or anything like that. We are expected to be different from the world, Christians. Every one of us. The world is often indecent and improper. We are called to propriety and decency. The world doesn't care what, in, in terms of what it's doing as opposed to what someone thinks about what they're doing. The world's selfish. The Christian is to be the exact opposite of that. Touch not the unclean thing and I'll receive you and will be a father unto you. And You shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord God Almighty, having, God Almighty, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. The flesh, Peter calls it uh, in, um, I think it's 1 Peter chapter 2 in verse 11. Abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. It's pictured as a fight in the Bible. And I'm afraid sometimes Christians just give up on the fight because they want to fit in. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. See, we have promises that we're looking forward to. And we need to think about our daily conduct how we live. And then the second passage is our scripture reading that Darren read to us. So let's go back there and we'll wrap it up. Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 5. Colossians 3. So the, And I've explained this to you before. When you start reading Colossians 3 and verse 1, it's almost like it starts in the middle of a conversation. In fact, it does because it says, if then you're risen with Christ. Well, what does that mean? You have to go back to Colossians chapter 2 where it says you are buried with him in baptism. You're buried with him. If then therefore you are risen with Christ, that's Romans 6 and verse 4, you're raised to walk in newness of life, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. So skip down to verse, that's the context of what we're starting to, get, to read here. Verse 5, mortify. <clears throat> Put to death is what that phrase means. Put to death therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection. And this one <laughs> in the King James concupiscence. I have never in my life used that word apart from reading Colossians 3 and verse 5. Okay, What does that word mean? If you were to look at it in a New King James Version, it says evil desire. If you look at it in the, in the Greek lexicons, you know, basically the Greek language dictionary, it says evil sexual desire. That's what we've been talking about this morning. And covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Now notice what he says here in verse 7. Again, talking to Christians who Colossians 2.12 have been buried with him. Colossians 3 verse 1 have been risen with him. You used to do this stuff. You used to walk in these things when you lived in them. But, but now ye also put off all of these. So you mortify these things, verse 5. And then you put off all this other stuff. And then you skip down to verse 12. Put on their... So it's not enough as a Christian to be baptized into Christ, to be raised up, to stop doing bad stuff. That's absolutely part of it. But look starting in verse 12. Put on therefore. You've got, now you've got to put some clothes on. Spiritually speaking, of course. As the elect of God, holy and beloved. Bowels of mercies. Compassion That's what that means. Kindness, humility of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. So, yeah, you got to stop doing bad stuff, but you got to start doing the right stuff. I've said this before. You don't have to be an evil person to be lost. You can just be neutral. You got to put off and you got to put on as a Christian. There are responsibilities on both ends. Christian modesty. So let's wrap this up here. In just a minute, we're going to start singing our song of invitation, Is Thy Heart Right With God? 
Listen to the definition again from the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary. Dressing or behaving. This, those things go hand in hand, okay? It's not just about one's dress, although that certainly is included in it. Dressing or behaving so as, listen to this, so as to avoid impropriety or indecency. Why? Because 1 Timothy 2.9, that's why. Because we are people who profess godliness. Because we're Christians, that's why. That's not a, I don't think that's a sufficient answer. We need to go deeper as we have done today. We all need to be proper, decent, modest people. And there is a set standard in the Bible. See, the point being here, and we'll wrap it up, God expects something of his people. Again, Colossians 3.5, put off. Colossians 3.12, put on. He expects a change. That's called conversion. We have to be converted to Christ. We have to be converted to God in his way. It's not enough just to be baptized and then go on doing whatever we want to do or whatever we did before. That's not conversion. That's getting wet. We need to be converted to Christ's way of thinking, the biblical way of thinking. It may be that there's someone here this morning who has never been converted to Christ. Maybe you've never obeyed the gospel at all. Maybe you've never even known much about baptism. Because we talked about that in Colossians chapter 2, being buried with him in baptism. If you have some questions about it, please ask those questions. It's Jesus who tells us, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16, verse 16. Now, if you've been studying about that or you know what you need to do and you're ready to do it, we're here to help you obey the gospel this morning. Maybe you're here this morning and you're a child of God and you need to come back. Or you need to change the way you think. That's called repentance. That's, what, that's all that word means. Change the way you think. If you need to do that, we want to encourage you. If you need help in a public way, we are here for you. We want to help you. If you need to respond to the gospel in either way, let's do it right now as we stand and sing.